At 1703, the ground shook across Japan. Then, just minutes later, it happened again. Two megaquakes, nearly back to back, sent shockwaves from the ocean floor to the nation's busiest cities. Sirens echoed, coastal towns braced for the unknown, and official tsunami advisories swept the eastern coast. But what exactly turns twin earthquakes into a massive tsunami threat? And how do authorities decide who is at risk? The answers begin. In the next few minutes, the Japan Meteorological Agency, or JMA, seismic intensity maps painted a clear picture as the dust settled. The strongest shaking, levels four to five on the JMA scale, spread across Iwas and Miyagi, reaching deep into coastal valleys and fishing towns. In these zones, buildings rattled, power lines swayed, and local alarms set off a chain reaction of warnings. Within minutes, official tsunami advisories were issued for Iwata, Miyagi, and Fukushima. The advisory means waves up to one meter could strike the coast, and everyone in low-lying areas must leave for higher ground immediately. A tsunami advisory does not confirm a destructive wave, but it signals dangerous currents, flooding risk, and the need for urgent evacuation. Iwat Prefecture, closest to the offshore epicenter, faced the highest alert. Neighboring Miyagi, with broad coastal exposure, was next. Fukushima, just south, was included as a precaution, following standard protocol when offshore quakes of this size are detected. These three prefectures form Japan's most tsunami-prone coastline, a region shaped by past disasters and constant readiness. Chiba, Aomori, and Hokkaido were not under the initial advisory. Their status remained under review as tide gauge readings streamed in. By 5.15 p.m. Japan Standard Time, evacuation orders echoed through city speakers and mobile phones in the advisory zones. Maps on every major broadcast and government site highlighted the danger zones in yellow tracking the advisory reach in real time. For residents, the meaning was unmistakable. Move inland, avoid rivers, and do not return until the all clear. As the alert spread, coastal communities braced for the next phase, watching for any sign the sea might rise. Rail traffic froze across northeastern Japan as soon as the first tremors struck. Inside the JR East Control Center, Automated earthquake sensors triggered an immediate shutdown of all Shinkansen and local trains between Iwata, Miyagi, and Fukushima. System protocols require a full stop whenever seismic intensity reaches level four or higher. Within seconds, hundreds of trains coasted to a halt, some in tunnels, others on open track. Crew members began safety checks and radioed updates to dispatch. Passengers waited quietly in carriages, following instructions delivered by intercom and staff. Power grid systems flickered in coastal towns. Utility companies reported temporary blackouts affecting parts of Iwadi and Miyagi. Backup generators powered critical sites, hospitals, evacuation centers, and some train stations, while crews worked to restore service. Street lights along main roads switched to emergency mode, and traffic signals operated on battery backup. Safety systems like these are the result of years of planning since previous disasters. Automated train stops and grid isolation are designed to prevent derailments, fires, and cascading failures. Even as the shaking subsided, JR East teams ran diagnostic checks before clearing any train to move again. In most areas, rail service remained suspended for over one hour, with priority given to lines serving evacuation routes. Movement stopped, but chaos did not follow. Instead, systems acted as intended, buying precious time for both passengers and emergency crews. As alerts continued, the focus shifted to understanding what caused such widespread disruption in a matter of minutes. Twin ruptures are rare, and they behave differently from the single, massive quakes that most people remember. In 2011, a single rupture tore open nearly 500 kilometers of the Japan Trench in one event, a magnitude 9.0, the strongest ever recorded in Japan. That single break unleashed enough energy to trigger a catastrophic tsunami across the entire Tohoku coast. In 2004, the Indian Ocean earthquake followed a similar pattern with a single enormous rupture stretching over 1,300 kilometers. What happened today is not a repeat of those events. Instead, two separate faults slipped within minutes, one at magnitude 7.8, the next at magnitude 7.6. This pattern, called a twin rupture, spreads energy across a wider area but over shorter fault lengths. Scientists call each break a rupture. 
A rupture is a section of the fault that slipped and released built-up stress. When ruptures happen close together, the shaking can blanket a broader region, but the tsunami risk depends on how much the seafloor actually moved. That is why geodetic sensors and satellite data are now critical. Experts need to see exactly where and how much the Earth shifted before confirming the true scale of the tsunami hazard. Sensors across Japan's coastline switched to high alert as soon as the shaking stopped. At the National Research Institute for Earth Science and Disaster Resilience, scientists tracked satellite and ground data for signs of crustal movement. A tool called INSAR, Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, uses satellite images to spot subtle shifts in the ground. After the twin quakes, the first satellite pass revealed an irregular zone of displacement just west of the epicenters, though the full extent was still under review. Dr. Takashi Hattori at NIED explained that these early patterns can signal whether the seafloor has lifted or dropped enough to drive a tsunami. Meanwhile, tide gauges monitored by the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center streamed real-time data from harbors along the Sanriku coast. Each spike or dip in water level was logged and tracked against model predictions. By late evening, coastal tide stations, including Ofunato, remained under close watch, but no official surge readings above advisory levels had been published. Scientists continued to analyze every line of data, searching for any sign that the sea might rise further. A tsunami forms when a large section of the seafloor suddenly lifts or drops, pushing a massive volume of water outward in all directions. Unlike storm surges, which are driven by wind and pressure from above, a tsunami is triggered directly by the Earth's movement below the ocean. In the case of these twin earthquakes, scientists are watching for signs that the seafloor has shifted enough to set a wave in motion. If a tsunami is generated, the time it takes to reach the nearest coastline is measured in minutes, not hours. For much of the Sanriku coast, the expected arrival window is between 10 and 30 minutes after the initial rupture. This is a short window that leaves little margin for hesitation. The Pacific Tsunami Warning Center models, based on the location and size of the ruptures, calculate how quickly a wave could travel from the offshore epicenters to towns like Kuji, Ofunato, and Miyako. Even a vertical shift of a few meters can send a wave racing toward shore at highway speeds. That is why advisories go out before there is visual confirmation, because the difference between warning and impact can be measured in moments. Authorities now face three possible paths, each shaped by new data and official monitoring. The most likely outcome is moderate surges, with waves up to 50 centimeters that can cause strong currents and localized flooding in harbors and river mouths. This scenario brings the highest chance of repeated aftershocks. Aftershocks are smaller earthquakes that follow a main event, and they may continue for days. If a delayed slip occurs along nearby sections of the trench, tide gauge readings may suddenly rise, prompting renewed advisories and fresh evacuations. In the rarest case, a hidden rupture could still trigger a damaging tsunami. So far, no evidence points to that. Scientists and emergency teams are watching for key triggers such as sudden jumps in tide gauge data, new clusters of aftershocks, or satellite signs of land movement. Each sign will help decide whether alerts are lifted, extended, or escalated. Evacuation shelters opened in school gyms and civic halls across Iwata, Miyagi, and Fukushima within half an hour of the first advisory. Volunteer Fire Chief Satoru Endo led teams through Kuji's darkened streets, checking on elderly residents and guiding them to safety. He said that their seniors remember 2011. Their legs may be slow, but their memories make them fast to move when the siren sounds. Officials and residents watched for key warning signs, a sudden increase in aftershocks, tide gauge spikes above 30 centimeters, or new alerts from the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. These are the red flags for the next three days. On the green list are sea levels stabilizing, advisories downgraded, and no new land movement detected. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida urged all citizens in affected areas to move away from the coast immediately and to remain vigilant for aftershocks and possible tsunami waves. DART sensors offshore continue to feed live day off data, giving communities the information they need to stay ready. Today, Japan's early warning systems turned seconds into survival. 
As seismic patterns grow less predictable, vigilance is the nation's frontline defense. Real-time science, community drills, and rapid alerts now stand between disaster and safety. In this new era, readiness, tested and proven, remains Japan's strongest shield against the sea.